So, um, yeah, you know, why are we here, right? Um, well, we're here for a conversation, right? This is not a conference. Um, we're not here to see presentations and listen politely to them. Um, we're not here to check email in the back and work on our presentations. Um, we're here to do what we can only do with a group of field leaders um, in the same room, which is have a kind of conversation that starts to happen for little moments in the hallways of conferences and then gets cut off, right? So the, the question here is, what if we really let that conversation get its momentum and keep going over three days. Uh, then there's that other question, right? Like, why are we here, right? Like, why us in particular? And I think this is actually a, a pretty good question. Um, like, if you look at the kind of work that, you know, I just pulled out of people's bios that they said they were doing, there is no obvious thread of connection <laughs> between the different things, right? And, you know, it can be pretty puzzling even doing something like listening to the conversations when people were introducing themselves last night. It's like, oh, that sounds like a lot of cool stuff that just is totally disconnected. Um, at the same time, I think there's lots of evidence that connections do seem to be forming across these things, right? It's things that people have already mentioned just in the welcomes this morning. There's all sorts of stuff going on that is starting to create different kinds of threads of connection between these communities, right? So, so why is that? Um, I think we all probably have different theories. My personal theory is that all these communities are starting to see computational processes as part of culture. Right? They're starting to see computational processes as a part of culture maybe in different ways, right? maybe for cultural communication and expression, maybe as tools for investigating things about culture, maybe as cultural artifacts that need to be analyzed and understood, maybe all of those things at the same time. But I think everyone here is actually in some way involved in this project. And, um, I, and that, I think, is, um, is what makes me so excited to have us all in the same room, is that we're working on this in different ways and we're talking about it with different language, but but we could come together, and I think coming together would be very powerful, um, which is why I think you know, we need each other to move forward, right? Um, the disciplines we come from need each other, and we realize that because we're doing interdisciplinary work. I think our individual models of doing interdisciplinary work can learn from each other. Um, I think that, in general, this interdisciplinary set of fields, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> this kind of work, can move forward, but it really should find some way to exist except for on the periphery of a bunch of other fields, right? There needs some to be some other mode. And we, I think we need each other to do that, even if we don't need each other to keep doing what we're already doing. Okay, so then the thing I really promised, right? Like, what are we going to do here? <laughs> um, so we're going to discuss five themes. We're going to develop some priorities for a white paper because you know one of those things that's nice to have is sort of like, oh, here we've articulated some ideas, some recommendations, um, some projects, proposals. Um, as I said, we're gonna develop multi-institution project ideas. We're gonna have a conversation with people who are involved in field building actively. We're gonna select, refine, and develop project plans. Let me go a little more into what these things are. So the first theme is lessons learned, right? So I don't know how many of you recognize this. It's uh, Christopher Strachey and maybe also Alan Turing's love letter generator for the Manchester Mark I, right? Um, so we've had digital art since we've had modern digital computers, right? As soon as there was the Manchester Mark I, there was digital art. And interestingly, I think the first piece of digital art was digital literature, right? So this was 60 years ago. Um, we had also the first video game around the same time. Strachey also created a version of Checkers that was on a video display that would also make fun of you for making bad moves on a line printer, right? Um, you know, it was only 10 years later that we had Space War and we'd established a lot of the basic vocabulary of video games. Um, so we've had interactive entertainment basically as long as we've had digital computers. And it's been decades that we've been using computers to make new kinds of media. I don't know how many of you saw Wrath of Khan in the theater, I did. Right? So like, it's um, sort of shocking to think that that was 30 years ago that we had you know, a full scene in a, in a movie that was generated with a computer. And it was only a few years later that the Avid was introduced. Right? So this is actually all stuff that's you know, decades um, behind us. Right? So I think we have, we have a lot of lessons that we've started to learn from these things and we can start to articulate them. Um, similarly, we've had well-developed examples of the humanities interpreting and contributing to the design of computational systems for decades, right? So, you know, Brenda's book, Computers as Theater, which came out of earlier work even at Atari, right? It was trying to say what the humanities knows about things like drama, right? What the humanities knows about the arts can be applied to the design of computational systems that are meant to reach people as media, right? And um, people like Phil Egre, you know, saying, 
what, what's blocking progress in artificial intelligence? Well, part of it might be that we have the very concept of what it means to be human and intelligent wrong, and using concepts from the humanities to try to actually interpret at a system level what was the trouble with artificial intelligence. And even though it's a very humanities book, it grew out of his work directly developing artificial intelligence at MIT. Or also things like MIT Project Athena, right? You know, things where people were working in a really interdisciplinary way to imagine Imagine what the future of computing could be for scholarship, but also for a lot of other kinds of uses. So I think we have lessons learned from that that actually connect to the previous set of lessons. Um, so uh, this first theme is basically going to be about what lessons have we learned, um, what recommendations might we make based on those lessons, what future projects should we do based on these lessons or to communicate these lessons. So that's what we're going to be doing before lunch. We'll be done like that, no problem. OK, so um, theme two is operationalization and beyond. That's what we're doing this afternoon. And I realize operationalization is one of those words that I use all the time and lots of other people don't. So what, do, what does that mean? Right? Um, I'd say another way of putting that is how to get arts and humanities ideas into computational systems and how to use the systems to think about art and humanities ideas. So for example, here's an um, uh, example of operationalization from my colleague Arnov, who's in the room. Um, so this is a, a game about taking photographs, and it generates these levels, right? And you can have lots of ways that you would have a game about um, taking photographs. In this case, what he's done is he's put into the computational system some basic rules of photographic composition, right? Balance, third, spacing, and so on. And he's just, you know, it's very simply trying to take an idea idea from how we understand an art form and put it into a computational system. Um, now, this is not a joke about the Citizen Kane of games. OK, it is. I stole it from Arnoff, right? But um, uh, so one of the things that this points to is things that have been powerful in other kinds of media, including things that have been powerful about, say, how to represent characters, can be powerful in the experience we give people of interactive media. So you know, we can take these ideas from the arts and humanities. We can put them into computational systems. But we can also think about building and interpreting those systems themselves in a different way, and we can get new insights from that process. So that's what that theme will be about. Uh, and then we'll have dinner. Um, so um, we're going to talk about different ways that arts and humanities ideas can be embodied in computational systems. We're going to talk about new kinds of reflection that can come from building these systems. And in general, we're going to talk about what are powerful approaches for interpreting the ideas that computational systems express. Then um, the following morning, we'll do um, a theme of guiding and evaluating. Um, so I can say this because I sit in a computer science department, although that's only you know, a, a part of my training, right? Um, I'd say you know, computer science has some great tools for evaluating things like efficiency. So if you want to be efficient in your execution, if you want to be efficient in your maintenance of a system, if you want to be efficient in your task completion, we've got a great bag of tricks. Um, but if you want to do something like say, how do we move toward this being a more powerful and meaningful media experience? I think our pockets are basically empty. Right? And so we need to think about some other way of guiding and evaluating the work. Um, so th we started working on this game here, Prom Week, shortly after I published this book, Expressive Processing, in the software study series from MIT Press. And one of the things that I was trying to do while we were building the system was to think each time we said, OK, how should we revise the system? Like, well, how would I interpret this if this was one of the case studies made by someone else that I was writing about in my book, right? Like, if I was to close read this system, what would be the ideas that it would express? And if what we were going to do was make a revision to the system that would make it stop expressing the idea we wanted it to express, we knew we were taking a wrong turn, right? Because no matter how well you work out communicating the system to people and helping people understand how they can interact with it, if you've got the ideas wrong in the base of the system, all you're going to do by clarifying at the interface level is give people a more and more wrong idea of what you meant. Um, not that the top level is not a challenge. Um, so this is, I'd say, a sort of nascent idea of how you might guide and evaluate this work. Um, I haven't done anything to formalize it. I haven't nothing to evaluate it as a method of evaluation. But I think there are a bunch of things like this that everyone here is doing kind of informally. Oh, you know, actually, I'm kind of using this other thing. It's not just the, the way I tell the funders that I'm evaluating it, right? Um, and so I think we, we need to think about these things. Um, so what methods are we using officially or unofficially for guiding and evaluating our work? What new ones should we be trying? 
How we can evaluate these strategies is a question. Do they actually help us create more compelling work if that's the goal? And how can we change the field to make successful strategies that we're starting to develop more widespread? And actually the kind of thing that you could put in the evaluation section of a paper or the evaluation section of um, a grant proposal or the report to your boss about like, okay, this is why we actually spent our time this way. Um, so theme four um, is media technology innovation. And that'll be the afternoon of tomorrow. Um, so I'd say basically the arts and humanities suggests lots of things that current media technology can't reach. Um, so what are strategies for inventing this next generation media? So for example, one idea from the, human from the arts that has inspired a lot of technical work is the idea of the holodeck, right? But you know, so what, what if you wanted to use something like the holodeck to create a Brechtian experience? Or what if you wanted to use it to create a Boalian experience, right? People have asked these questions, and they've asked a lot of other questions that have been inspired by the arts. Um, and we really need to know, well, I don't know, how do you start to answer that question, right? I know how to answer a question about, um, you know, how do I get my database query to go faster? But that's not this kind of question, right? So um, one, we're going to talk about things like what role do arts and humanities inspirations play in different technology development approaches and contexts? How can we form and support teams to accomplish this work? And how can media technology move forward, both incrementally and radically? Um, the final theme that we'll have is one about field building models. So um, how can we build projects that will transform the field, especially when the field itself is built for the kinds of projects we have now? So we'll have presentations of three projects that model different kinds of potential transformation. Uh, finally, I want to talk, oh, actually, oh, it's not quite finally, although, oh, yeah, we're just going to keep running behind schedule. So um, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to use the time. So we'll have a framing session for each of the first um, four themes, and there will be time, because everyone here is an expert, to actually not just have presentations, but also have interruptions and discussions and so on. Um, we're going to have um, breakout groups for each of those four themes. Um, then we're going to talk about two kinds of things primarily. Uh, recommendations to specific constituencies for moving this work forward as related to the current theme. And also um, potentially transformative projects related to the theme that are bigger than what one lab or one institution might do on their own. So we're going to start out by brainstorming in both of these categories. And then the idea is that we drill down into two or three of those sort of project ideas in each group. And that um, at the end of the uh, breakout time, we actually come back and report back those two or three ideas that came out of each group. And that we really have developed some specifics over the time that group talk together. Uh, and then um, I have a nefarious plan to mix you together all the time, um, potentially sometimes to your discomfort. So, you know, meals where you have to stand, long bus rides next to unfamiliar people, um, and so on. Um, because the idea is that, you know, sure, we'll throw these ideas out on the table. But again, the way they're really going to reach that next point is in the sort of informal moments of conversation, in the like, oh, what do I say to this person? Like, um, oh, well, you know, I could talk about that thing. Um, and then we'll, uh, the final day, have, uh, in addition to the model projects, we'll also have a discussion with field builders. Then we'll have some full group discussion of which of the ideas sort of seem most promising and that we'd most like to see developed. And then people will break up into small groups to hopefully actually get a few of these projects to the point where they have a kind of one-page summary of them, where we could actually say, okay, here's a project that we as a community want to see happen. Here are some people who actually want to work on it. How do we make this project happen? How do we get it some momentum over the next year, as opposed to, um, you know, just what would it be nice for someone else to do? I, you know, like I can very easily think of lots of projects I would love to have someone in the field do, but I really want you to have a conversation about the projects that you would passionately want to do with people who are here. Um, so what kinds of projects? Um, Really, these should be projects that I couldn't think of ahead of time, right? It's, it's bad if I could have thought of them ahead of time. None of you needed to travel, right? Um, but P I, I have been urged to give you some examples of just the sort of territory I'm thinking about for projects. So here are some examples anyway. Um, 
So for example, we can imagine something like saying, you know, some of us in this room, we want to create a next generation transmedia narrative, right? And we want to retain some things that are cool from things like ARGs, mystery, spectacle, real world integration, social interaction. But we also want some things that just aren't possible now, right? For example, we want to have meaningful choices and individualized narrative progression for every single person who is part of the narrative. Well, that means we need some computer science research towards new tools. Those new tools are actually built for artists to express the ideas that are in the narrative, but presumably we need some way to structure that tool. And part of the way we might structure that tool is through humanity's interpretations of what's already going on inside those genres, right? Say the genres we want to mix together. Um, and then we can imagine even crazier things, right? Like our stretch goal is that we're going to dynamically match make each person with others who should be part of their story, right? If you're somebody who um, is sort of, you know, not, not as involved in the narrative as we would like you to be, we're just going to give the next piece of information you need to your friend who's also playing. Um, but we're going to tell them that if they give it to you, and we're going to create this social dilemma between different players that actually is part of the story of the game, right? That could be an interesting stretch goal. Um, another possible project would be something rather different, like, say, an interdisciplinary computational thinking intervention. This could be a curriculum for use in schools. This could be something that you would just, you know, do informally in your own house. And there are things that we want to retain, right? So we want to retain things like tools that have powerful encapsulation of different computational thinking approaches. There's cool stuff out there like, you know, Kodu and Scratch and Alice and so on. Like, you know, we, we don't want to just throw away that tradition. We want to learn from that tradition, maybe build directly on that tradition. But we want to add some things. So for example, we want to add a focus on expressing student ideas about the world, right? The fact that the computational system is a way of saying, here's part of how I think the world works or could work, right? And this requires things like art and design critique, right? You need to be able to say to the student, well, you know, it's actually not coming across. Maybe if you tried this. Um, it also requires the tools to be able to do kinds of things because at least personally, I don't want to express very much about shooting. Um, about the world, right? Like, you know, there, there's a, there's maybe, you know, there's maybe a place for that, but there are lots of other things I'd like to express. And a lot of tools that make making games easy don't make making games easy about kinds of things or making media easy about kinds of things that we really experience in our everyday lives. Um, and also we want to do things like add historical context and critical interpretation of what those processes express. The processes that the students are building, but also the processes that students encounter in society, right? Part of what's important about computational thinking is it should make you a better citizen because you live in a computational world. And building your own processes, if coupled with interpreting those processes and those of others, is actually a way of bringing that promise home. Uh, and then finally, just to you know, try to find another distant point in the map, you can imagine something like a software scholar's workbench. Right? So um, we want to retain the kinds of things that people are already doing in disciplines like software studies and platform studies. Right? We want to retain this sort of careful interpretation. But we also want to do things like be able to snapshot, share, and cite system states, right? Why can't we do that? That's broken. Um, we want tools for extracting system resources, exploring source repositories, citing individual files and lines, decompilation, visualizing activity, tracking shared dependencies, and seeing how sort of histories of software have grown through shared libraries and so on. Uh, and maybe we want a stretch goal of something like um, prototyping self-interpreting critical editions of operating software, right? Um, why not, right? Um, and and so um, hopefully this is giving you an idea that I really do think this is a community that's capable of coming up with a wide range of possible projects that could hopefully genuinely be exciting because they will come up from you and you will go forth to do them and maybe I'll get to collaborate with a couple of you. Um, but now I've actually, um, as promised, gone over time and I want to go um, directly into theme one. But we can't go directly because we're going to have to do a little AV swap. But our first speaker is Brenda Laurel. Thanks very much.